surrounded by so great cl a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sealed at the right hand of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, today I would like to welcome a guest speaker that God has led us to our church. Um, he's not a stranger to some of us. He's going to be a stranger to some of you all. I actually tried to lure him back. I said, you know, whatever they're paying you at the other church, we'll double it to bring him back. And then he said, they're not paying him anything. I said, exactly. Right? But it didn't work. Anyway. So David Beck, um, our, our prodigal son, has returned. He's going to give us uh, God's word today. Uh, it's great to have him back. Can we just give him a warm welcome of applause just to welcome him back? Hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's nice to be back. It feels like being home, and so I missed, uh, missed y'all. Even though I've visited a few times, uh, it's good to be back here. And so, uh, speaking of home, I recently moved back home about, well, recently, around September of last year. Uh, and so, it's back in Toledo, Ohio. I'm living with my parents. And though, yes, it's been about 10 years since I've been with them, it's like going to this old place, but there's a lot of new issues coming up. And one thing that I noticed when I was going when I was at home was I felt like I was cheating a little bit, right? Because in high school, when you're growing up, you kind of expect your parents to take care of you, right? And then the moment you're 18, you're shipped off into college, the real world, or working at another job. And you go through all these things. And for me, when I went back home, I felt like that independence was being taken from me, or I had put independence as like this big goal of my life, that I want to prove everyone that I can do things by myself. And so, like, I'm at home, and my mom is making my meals, right? And she makes lunch and dinner for me. She helps uh, uh, help me go to work in the morning. Uh, for my dad, he sometimes pays for, like, gas in my car. Um, and when my mom was in Korea, he'll also make meals, things like that. And so for me, I'm just like, oh, I feel like a child. I feel like I'm not able to do this by myself, and I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting angry because I want to prove myself because I'm the baby of my family, and God forbid I can take care of myself once in a, uh, once in a while. And so all this is going on. And at one point, one day I woke up, and I was like, where did this goal of independence come from? Why do I want to live my life so just by myself? It's, it's what I do, it's what I've done. I want to prove so much to, to people who aren't really expecting that out of me. And so I don't know who I'm trying to prove this to. At one point, becoming independent, becoming self-staining was idolatrous for me. And so it got to the point where I would prefer um, I'm not sure if this works. Yeah, I would prefer making like my own peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with my bare hands rather than get meals like this from my mom, of which this is like, the past couple meals I've had have been this in my lunchbox. And for some reason, it's just like, this is so much better, right? My mom is helping me and, all right, and, she, she, and, and, and I know I, I got to a point where it's not because I'm just her child anymore, although that's a large part of the reason, but she's preparing these meals. My dad is helping me because they know what it's like to grow up in the States to some extent, right? They know what it's like to work a full-time job, to try to be stable financially. They, they, they know this thing, and, and in that heart, I believe they're, they're trying to help me through it. And here I am making a fuss because I just want to be independent and grow by myself. And so I don't know if this is what some of y'all are going through, um, if maybe for the younger adults or post-grad, maybe. Um, but I think a lot of times I find this in my faith as well. Right? Because, you know, in, 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 in a lot of what we grow up with, and what I grew up with, it's all about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, right, with God. I don't know why I went Southern for a second there. Um, and yeah, for some reason, everything's about our personal relationship, personal relationship. What are you supposed to do? And I, I think in that, we lack, um, we lack sight of the faith that the church is supposed to be all together, right? And yet, because everything is so much about ourselves and our faith, right, even in our prayers, if they're not authentic, if they're not genuine, then we, we feel like it's fake, right? Or, and we need to create the best things by ourselves. And in my mind, it's almost like we're trying to create peanut butter and jelly sandwiches of prayer uh, when there are other prayers from other people that we, that we can pray, right? And these are great and glorious and deep prayers, right, from these other people. And yet, a lot of times, I wonder if we have that sort of spiritual independence that we crave and that becomes idolatrous. And so, 
Um, today, uh, what I want to speak to is that even though independence is good, being self-sustaining is good, those probably are goals that you want to go towards, uh, it's not everything. And the one thing that I want to share for today is that we journey and persevere in this Christian race, race uh, towards Jesus with a cloud of witnesses around us. And so, uh, again, I'm going to be turning to Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and let's look to the book that we love. And so Hebrews 12, 1, 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So for context, um, when we look at this passage, it starts off with the word therefore. And so it's referring to something that's happening right before this passage. Um, and so if we look to Hebrews 11, a large part of that chapter talks about the people in the Old Testament. And so it's like Abraham, Noah, Moses, Joseph, these, these famous characters. And it's like, hey, look at what they did in faith. Hey, these are people that we try to emulate. Hey, these people in faith did these things. And it's not just these characters, but it's the smaller characters in the Old Testament. It's the people that we've never heard of in the Old Testament. There are so many people that we have here. Right? And Hebrews 11 ends with this. In verse 39, Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. And so each of these figures um, that, are in that, past, that were in Hebrews 11, again, they acted in great faith. These are the heroes of the faith for the Jewish people. And, um, and yet they weren't able to see the fulfillment of the promises that God had given to them. Right? They weren't able to see the coming of Jesus. And why is that the case? I think verse 40 kind of points to this. Because in what verse 40 is, uh, in verse 40, it kind of talks about how God wants to connect the people of the Old Testament to the people of the New Testament, right? If the, old people, if the people in the Old Testament acted in faith and they saw Jesus coming to them, then in some sense, there is a little more separation. It's like, why, why would they need us? And it's like, how can we be connected to them? And yet, it's through Jesus, it's the connection of the people who anticipated Jesus and the people who are able to experience and to know of Jesus and to be able to know that it happened, right? And so, because of all this, the work that Jesus does brings the people of the Old Testament and New Testament together and so that's how we get to our passage here today, right? And it starts with this, therefore, uh, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And uh, to break a little bit of this stuff down, because I'm going to be repeating that phrase, cloud of witnesses, like 20 times in this sermon, um, a cloud of witnesses or kind of refers to the people who have witnessed the work of God in their life. Right? And so these are people who, uh, again, like people in the Old Testament, acted in faith. They were able to see the work that God did for them, that God did in them, that God did through them. And that, yeah, that's the main sort of context in the way that I'll be referring to these cloud of witnesses. Because you can also think of the cloud of witnesses as people like watching you, right? People in heaven kind of spectating and they're like turning on their TV. It's like, oh, the Earth Channel. And they're just seeing everything that's happening here. But that can become a little bit problematic because then you're opening up like a theological can of worms and it's like, do people in heaven really watch over us? Or do they like, you know, if heaven is supposed to be a place with no brokenness, then why are they watching earth? Because there's a lot of brokenness here. And so again, these cloud of witnesses are people who have been witnesses to the work of God in their life. And so for the author who's writing the letter to the Hebrews, um, a lot of what he's referring to by these cloud of witnesses are the people in the Old Testament. But for us, there's thousands of years of history that passed by, and that cloud of witnesses that he's referring to has expanded in, well, infinitely right, to our time now. Right? And so who are some people who are in the cloud of witnesses for us today? And so for me, right now, I'm in seminary, and I'm taking church history one and two. And there's just so much information, so many people, so much history, so much doctrine, so much heresy, so much all these things that, are, you know, that helped form the church as to what it is today. Right? And so you have people like St. Augustine in the top left, right, who was one of the early church fathers, right? He is one of the people who helped establish what the church actually believes uh, when, when the church is still relatively young, about 300, 400 years old, right? And then you have people in the bottom two, John Calvin, Martin Luther, right? They helped spearhead the Reformation that helps change all of Christianity, right, about in the 1500s as the church splits from the Catholic church into now are the denominations that we have, the different Protestant churches that we have, these are heroes and these are significant figures in church history. 
And then you also have people like John Wesley, who's in the top right, right? Someone, he was, an Amer he was a, a British person, came to America, and he helped, his preaching and his evangelistic spirit helped change and bring revival to the States, right? And it's really through his legacy that this church exists today, the UMC. And so we have all these people who are in the cloud of witnesses around us. But again, it's the cloud of witnesses not limited to the people who are famous. It's not limited to the people that we know of. But the cloud of witnesses has saints throughout the ages that, yeah, that we've never heard of and that aren't famous. And yet they're beloved and they're well known in the kingdom of heaven, right? Because you have so many martyrs in the early church who literally, who died for their faith, when Rome is persecuting them, is killing them. They're saying, no, I would rather die. There are descriptions of, of, of women who actually gave, who would, well, it gets really gory, and I don't know who, which children are watching this, but like there's pregnancy, and they, they would despise getting pregnant because then there is a way out for them. They would rather die and not be pregnant for their faith. It, it's, it's weird. Um, but a lot of the, you have these people who aren't very well known who die for their faith, and you have martyrs now in today's church history, missionaries over the world who are in places who are preaching because they were witnesses to the work that God had done in their lives to the point of them saying, I'm willing to die for my faith. Right? These are some of the people who are in this cloud of witnesses that surround us today. But not just them too. Right? For in this cloud of witnesses, it could also be our grandfathers, our grandmothers, the elders, deacons, mothers, fathers, people in the churches that we attended or people that we've never heard of who suffered and who cried out to God in the midst of all the things that they were going through to help lay the foundations of our faith. And so when we run this Christian faith, Right? It's not a matter of us trying to do things. It, it, it's important, yes, that we try to build that personal relationship with God. It's important that we try to do these things because uh, there is an individual work that has to be done. But at the same time, we also look to the communal work, to the work that God has been doing through the ages with all of these people here. And so I think it would be a waste, right? To, oh, what? That's really fast. Um, so I think it would be a waste to, to not learn from them, to not look at them. Right? And so look and learn from people who, who struggle with the very sins that to lay aside that you, that you might struggle with now. Right? You are not the only ones, we are not the only ones who have struggled with things like lust, who have struggled with things like pride, who have struggled with things like doubting our beliefs, who have struggled in things that many of us go through. Right? There are people who have written accounts on this from the beginning of time, right? Or, or from the beginning of the church, we have people who write on these topics. Learn from them. Right? Whether it's people in the scripture, people just in history overall. Right? Let's learn and let's lament and be encouraged by the people who had to run this race with all the endurance. Right? One prominent example I bring up a lot is the black church in America. Right? How do you, in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of slavery, in the midst of Jim Crow laws, in the midst of racism, are you still able to run this race with endurance to say God is still good? To believe that God is still with you in the midst of your suffering? Or maybe it's looking to the saints with disabilities, physical, uh, emotional, mental, who have had to go through so many barriers in their life, who question why God made them like this, and yet are able to speak of the goodness of God and how that God has created them. Let's learn from these people who had to do these things with endurance. Let's learn from the, from the cloud of witnesses that are running this race with us that can stand witness to the work that God has done in their lives, whether it's far in the past history or in modern uh, times nowadays and a cloud of witnesses that surround us. And yet, what I don't want to do is just say, hey, let's follow these people, right? Because in verse two, it reminds us, it brings us back, hey, when we're running this race with all together, the, the race that we're running is towards Jesus, right? With all the saints, with all the people, there is this individual part of us that has to run, and yet, remember, we can look around, right? It's not just us running this race with God in front of you. It's not just us looking to our side and like just our church who's like running this race together. But the race is meant to be run with the saints and with the Christians of all through the ages, right? And let's learn from them, and let's remember that they are with us, they are for us, and by some level, they are cheering us on, right? And these are the people that we can look to to say, wow, in their life, in the midst of all that they went through, they finished, right? And so let's look, um, let's look to them, let's learn from them. And let's, yeah, and let's have the comfort and peace of knowing that in our Christian race, right, the person that we look to is the one that founded it, He's the one that's going to finish it, right? There is a work that we'll have to do. We'll be stumbling, we'll be tumbling, we'll be falling, we'll be tripping, we'll be sinning, we'll be doing so many things, we'll be failing in a lot of ways, and yet the person that we run to is going to be the one that perfects our faith, right? And so this, this, this Christian race that we run, it's, 
not one that is simply individual, it's not one that is simply personal, although that is important, but there's so many people that we can look to, and what I don't want us to do is to become dependent only on ourselves or to try to run through this Christian race by ourselves. And so what are some things that we can do, right, to live and run in this race practically? Right? So first one, learn with and from others. And so for people who know me, 75% of, of the advice I give is start a book club, right? Because there's just a lot of books and there's a lot of people. And eventually you get to a point where you can just, you know, start a book, start reading together and then have conversations with one another and be able to kind of learn from one another here with the people around you as well as you can learn uh, personally reading books, uh, biographies, autobiographies, or the different works that people have written, because in a lot of those works might have the answers to the questions that you're looking for. It's not, because again, it's not like we're the only ones that have struggled with this. And so for some quick examples, you have Confessions by St. Augustine, you have the books like we're giving out, Gentle and Lowly, that we learned from the Puritans. And if you want to grow in your prayer life, if you want to grow in your prayers, because maybe you're nervous when you, whenever you have to pray out loud, or maybe when you talk to God, you're worried, hey, what do my prayers sound like? There's literal prayers that we can look to um, to be able to learn from them. And just as uh, you, uh, someone would create a meal for you and you ask for the recipe and you learn from how they have created their things and you can create your own things, right? it's okay. We can take those prayers and we can be like, man, what makes this prayer so good? And how can I learn from these prayers? How can I develop my prayer and my prayer life, whether it's praying for others, whether it's praying for myself, in a way that I can grow in my faith and I can help bless others? Or number two, there's discipleship with others, right? Again, this, the race that we run is meant to be done with one another. And so th while there is an individual work that we might do, look at the saints around you. Look at the people in your church around you. It, not always by age, right? Sometimes it will be by age. But there are people who have run this race longer than you have. And they can be witnesses to the work that God has done in their life, again, to the problems that maybe you're going through right now. And so for the younger people, I would say, generally speaking, it doesn't always have to be that youth is good, um, you know, talk to the older people. Older people, be witnesses to the younger people to say, man, this is the work that God has done in my life. I'm seeing a little bit of this in you. Let's, let's run this race together, right? And we run this race, again, together as a cloud, with the cloud of witnesses around us. And the last one, uh, to reflect, right? If 75% of the advice I give is to read a book and start a book club, the other 25% is to reflect, right? What are some of the things that you struggle with? What are some of the sins that you struggle to lay aside? What are... What, what causes those barriers and that difficulties for you to run this race with endurance, right? And so think about those things, plan those things, work with other people, be like, hey, can you help, to, can, let's, can you help me to be able to work on these things? Because that's a personal work that we have to do. We have to reflect on some of the difficulties that we go through. Uh, and so to close, uh, I just want to share a, like one and a half experiences or one and a half testimonies of the way that I think running this cloud of witnesses has been beneficial for me and which I hope can encourage you as well. Uh, so like I mentioned, I left LGM um, back in September. I don't know if I actually mentioned that. Um, and I go to a church now called Ann Arbor Hope Church. And there, the majority of the congregation are Korean families. You have a lot of old people. Um, and I look to y'all now, we're all relatively young. I'm in like the top third tier, top might be top five oldest people in this room, which terrifies me, <laughs> right? Um, but at Ann Arbor Hope, I'm like bottom 40 tier, right? Or like there, there, there's quite a large amount of people who are older than I am, right? And though I love worshiping here, though there is a power, these are songs that I know, these are songs I'm comfortable with, that I have history with, that have helped me before, um, it's a little bit different singing Living Hope here and singing Living Hope with the elders at Ann Arbor Hope Church people who are literally three times my age, who have been able to testify and be able to see the work, uh, the, the, the work that God has been doing in their life in faith, right? And hearing them in their broken English try to sing this song, it, I remember the first time I went there, cried. First time I cried in worship for a long time, right? And a lot of, uh, weirdly enough, Korean American people who go there, speakers, they weep during that worship because it's, it's the first time, one of the few times that they're able to hear all of a church congregation with all the old people, all the young people singing praises together that are recognizable for both the older and the younger. Right? And in that, I, I think I was able to realize that though there's a lot of pains I have about Korean churches, I can learn from them. These are a whole new cloud of witnesses that I've never considered before, and yet here they are running the race with me. Here they are testifying and being witnesses of the work that God has done in their life. And where the half testimony comes in, 
um, is in that sort of Korean sector of the cloud of witnesses um, that, uh, that I'm running this race, race with is a man, uh, Yi Do Chung, who was one of the first martyrs in, and pastors that came from Jeju Island, an island in Korea. And here's a man who, 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 who became a Christian right through the work of the first missionary that came to Jeju Island, and he died for his faith. And, and there were some things mixed in with anti-communism, anti-capitalism, a lot of the stuff that was going on in that time that which contributed to his death. But he was, he, he, he was martyred for what he believed and he would not be able to pray for certain things and because his heart was set on praying for other things. Right? And, and, and here is a witness to the work that, that God has done in Jeju. And now the church that he planted has about like 1,500 people who attend weekly. And it's not about the numbers, but it's the work and it's what he was able to witness to that proved powerful to those around him. And this is someone in the cloud of witnesses that I know that I can look to, that has run the race before, that can witness the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Um, and so, yeah, with that, uh, praise team, if you can come on up. Um, I just wanted to end this time um, by just taking some time to reflect, right? Who are the cloud of witnesses that, uh, who, are the, who are some of the faces in, in the cloud of witnesses that are running the race with you? When you think of people to look up to, look up to in the faith, who are some of these people? And so let's take some time to reflect on that, to pray on that, uh, and then to thank God for them as well. And then afterwards, I'll close this out in prayer, and then we'll go into worship. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.